We've been talking about how to use verses, to memorize verses, to be able to communicate truth about Christianity, about God's existence, to people in our lives who maybe either don't understand what Christianity teaches, or maybe have never heard a verse offered in any length. Uh, we're going to do that so to help you become a better Christian communicator, a better evangelist. And we're going to today take a look at Psalm 19. Now I'm going to give you some tips on how to memorize and use this psalm to be able to make a case for God's existence, because it's a great song that talks about both the uh, natural revelation, the, the things we know about God by looking at nature, and special revelation, the things we know about God by simply looking at His Word. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands, and day after day they pour forth speech, and night after night they reveal knowledge. They, they, they have no speech, they use no words. No sound is heard from them, but yet their voice goes out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God's pitched a tent for the sun, and it, it's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of his warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The, decrees of the Lord are are firm and all of them are righteous they're like they're, they're, they're more precious than gold than much pure gold they are sweeter than honey than honey from the honeycomb by them your servant is warned and in keeping them there is great reward but who can discern their own error forgive my hidden faults keep your servant also from willful sins may they not rule over me then I'll be blameless innocent of great transgression may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight Lord my rock and my redeemer now, this verse is rather long, I get it, and it's, that I'll put it on the screen here so you can see it. Um, but what's great about it, and I tried to say it as fast as I could so we can get to the meat of it, is that this is a verse that does a couple of things. In the first segment you see on your screen, that's a segment that's just about natural revelation. Then there's this transitional block about the, in the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. And then there's a second section, which is a section on special revelation of Scripture. Special revelation of Scripture. So in this first segment of our show today, I want to just talk about the, the first part of the psalm that talks about um, the natural revelation. What is revealed to us from nature? As we know in Romans 1, and no one's got an excuse, that all of us should know enough just from nature that's around us, from what's around our world. We should have enough to know that God exists so that no one knows that excuse. You should know from just the creation that there is a creator. And this is kind of what is being said in Psalm 19. Let's take a look at it. The heaven, now I've put in, um, in yellow those words that have helped me to memorize the verse. This is, these are not like important words necessarily theologically. I'm just looking for devices that I can use to help me memorize the verse. So when I say the heavens declare and proclaim, okay, heavens, are like the skies. So the heavens declare is pretty much like saying the skies proclaim, right? The heavens declare, the skies proclaim. This is kind of a parallel verse. So that first line, that first sentence was easy for me to memorize because the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Now, day after day they pour forth speech. And that's kind of a way of revealing a truth, is to speak it. And so night after night they reveal knowledge. So I looked at it this way. You got day after day they speak, Night after night, they reveal. It's kind of a similar pattern here. Again, now, but the same word, speech. They have no speech. Now, words and sound. You see in the third line here, speech, words, and sound feel like they are pretty much the same idea being spoken. It's about speech. They have no speech. Now, what he's saying here is, look, they're pouring forth speech and revealing knowledge, but I'm not saying that the heavens have a voice or that they uh, have lips they can speak with uh, or a voice box. I'm just, they have no speech. They're not using words. No sound is heard from them. But even though that's the case, their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. This is part of that Romans 1 idea that there's no excuse. I mean, even though they cannot use words, the nature of the heavens, even to this ancient psalmist, the nature of the heavens is such that you ought to know, you ought to hear what God is saying through His creation this first um, segment, this first part of Psalm 19, is really about how obvious it ought to be to all of us, just from cosmology, just from the world around us, just from looking at the heavens. There's something about them that you want to look at and go, wow, 
Now, this is not the first time someone has... I mean, we've been looking at the heavens for, for ages, and every generation of, of cosmologists or a person interested in astronomy, um, these are things that, that we, humans have been looking at the skies, looking at the, the, the universe around us, and have been in awe of the vast nature of the universe. But it's not just now, and as we develop science about how to look at the universe in a scientific way, it's not just that we're so primitive that we look at something as awesome and as large as the universe and we feel uh, so so small and so insignificant and we start to, to wonder if there's something bigger than us. It's not necessarily just an emotional response to the scale of the heavens that ought to draw us to see that there is a God. Instead, we now know from the science that the heavens are expanding. We also know that there is a cosmic background radiation throughout all of the universe. And these the nature of the expansion, right, and the fact that we know from the law of entropy, second law of thermodynamics, we know that the universe does not have a, it does not, it's not eternally old. It has a beginning. It hasn't existed forever. It is expanding from some point of contraction and the usable energy in the universe is dissipating from a point of high energy. And the background radiation is that signature from that high. We've got several good scientific reasons to recognize that the universe um, had a beginning. And of course, beginnings require beginners. And I think this is very true, that as we look at the heavens, we ought to be fully aware of God's existence because we would know that automatically there must be something out. The science demonstrates that now all space, time, and matter in the universe had a beginning. And that means whatever initiated all space, time, and matter, whatever began all of that, cannot itself be spatial, material, or temporal. It's something outside of space, time, and matter because the, the, the science demonstrates that there was no space before space. There was no matter before matter, no time before time. All of these things came into being and began to exist at the beginning of the universe. If that doesn't point you to something outside of space, time, and matter as a first cause, I'm not sure what else could. It's even today, knowing all that we know about science and about the universe and about cosmology, the heavens still declare both the glory and existence of God, because God is the most reasonable and best inference. Something, a being of immense power outside of space, time, and matter is still the expl best explanation for all space, time, and matter. So even now, the heavens still declare the glory of God, and the skies still proclaim the work of His hands. When I was memorizing Psalm 19, it, it always, and every time I've ever read it, and I love how the first part talks about natural revelation, and the last part talks about special revelation, but I never liked this middle section. <laughs> I'll just be honest about that. I never liked it because I knew that my skeptical self, and I would hear this all the time from people who would um, point to this part of the verse and say, you see how simple uh, these Christians were, or these ancient Jews were in this case. They're so simple that they describe the sun in this way. I'll put it on the screen for you. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. So really, so you think that the tent, the sun is like, like as you like the famous, the ancient Egyptians who believed that the, that the sun God would take the sun and put it in a chariot and, and race it across the sky. Is that what you guys think? It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other, and nothing is deprived of its warmth. Now look, as I look at this verse, uh, I think it's a kind of trite reading, a trite reading of this second section of Psalm 19, I think could uh, be you know, used by somebody to say, hey, you know, those ancient Jews, they had no idea about the sun and no idea about the nature and relationship of the sun to the solar uh, system, to Earth, to the universe, the galaxies. They had no idea. And so for them, they actually thought that God somehow pitched the tent, a, a tent for the sun. Okay, now, first of all, if you look at the verse, you can see that this is, not, this is, not, this is, a, meta, this is an, a metaphor. They are, it's an anthropomorphism. Of, of what, no, like not really using body parts, but it's, it's trying to use in human terms um, a description that is useful for the sun. Not that they actually, how do I know that's true? Well, look at the second part, uh, the second line. Do you really think they're saying that the sun is a bridegroom? Do you really think they're saying that the sun is a champion? No, of course, no, they're analogizing toward, they're, they're using a metaphor. They're analogizing towards something 
that they can say is similar to. Um, it's, it's, it, the fact that it comes up so consistently, the fact that, it, that we see the sun every day so consistently and it races across the sky, there's like a sense of urgency, right? As the world turns and the movement of the sun, you can see a movement of the earth related to the sun. It, from their perspective on earth, they sense a, a, a speed like it's every morning. You can't stop it. it it's, the sun's going to rise every day. We still say that. The sun will rise again. It'll be a better day tomorrow. The sun will rise again tomorrow. It'll be a better day. And so they are analogizing to this like a bridegroom that quickly comes out of his chamber, like a champion who's rejoicing to run his course. In other words, eager, consistent. Joy is every day. It's just another way of saying the same kinds of things we would say today. We're going to have a better tomorrow. We're, the same kinds of analogies and word uh, smithing we might use today was being used by the ancient psalmist. There's nothing in this second section of the psalm, though, that, that demonstrates that the psalmist actually thought that the sun was in a tent sometimes, or that the, the sun was um, actually like a bridegroom, or a bridegroom somehow carries the sun, or a chant. No, come on. These are all being used, and it's clear in the verse itself that he is using different descriptions of worldly things to describe something that's otherworldly to an audience that will understand it. The same way that Jesus uses proverbs that are mostly uh, agricultural proverbs to a society that is largely agricultural to describe theological principles. It's not as though Jesus thought that in heaven there were actually crops that were... No, he's using these stories, these wordsmithing in a way that describes a larger theological principle. Something as similar is happening here with the psalmist who is wordsmithing to describe a larger principle. So really it's through the first segment where it says the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands, all the way through to the end of this that says it rises at one end of the heavens, makes its circuit to the other, and nothing is deprived of its warmth. This is the cap. This cap is all of special, I'm sorry, of natural revelation, the things that nature can show us. Okay? Uh, but what's really clear, though, is we're about to turn a corner, and we're going to move from something that is seen in nature to something that is seen on the pages of Scripture. And what I'd like to tell people when I talk about this verse is that the psalmist was comfortable putting these two books of, of God together in the same uh, psalm, where he talks about the two ways that God reveals himself to us. And this is why I often say when we're talking to our kids about God's nature, we want to be able to use data from both books. If I'm talking about something that is a principle in nature, even something as esoteric as the triune nature of God, all I expect to be able to make a case for the triune nature of God from the pages of Scripture, because if, if Trinity is true, I should be able to make that case. But also there are some, there's a, a, a three-dimensionalism of, of the world around us, right? The, the physical realm is, is divided by width and height and depth, threes. Um, the time is past, present, future, threes. There are many aspects of our life and our existence in the universe that seem to be equally triune. It doesn't surprise me, they may simply reflect the triune nature of the Godhead. So there are some ways I might be able to use natural revelation to reflect truths that are in special revelation, right? Even our nature as soulish creatures, you know, mind, body, spirit, uh, these are things that are seem to be of triune nature even as humans. My whole point is that if I'm going to make a case for something to young people, I want to have the same confidence that the psalmist did and draw from two books written by God. Now, here's the other rub, though. What if something you think you see on the like through science? Because here's what I love about the earliest scientists. During the scientific revolution, it's clear that the vast majority of scientists who led that revolution in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, the vast majority were Christians, were Christ followers. They were. That explosion of science is largely due to Christians who saw their work, as Kepler said, thinking God's thoughts after him. They wanted to know, it's clear what special revelation said, but they saw as their role was to write in what's not obvious yet under natural revelation. In other words, the book of scripture has been written, but they were helping to write the book of nature by describing how it is that God works in the world around us. Now, there are going to be times when you're going to say, you know what, what I see here does not seem to match what I'm seeing over here. What do I do then? Well, if you, the, the, God wrote both these books. So if you see a difference between those two books, you're interpreting one or the other incorrectly. 
and it's possible for us to interpret the scientific data incorrectly. It's also possible for us to interpret the biblical data incorrectly. So what I love about this verse is it helps us to realize that God wants us to engage in that struggle, that there's more than one book from God. One book we get to help examine, and that's the book of nature. Take a break. When we come back, I'll give you the last part of this uh, psalm, which talks about God's special revelation. Connect with Cold Case Christianity on social media. Visit the Cold Case Christianity homepage and click the social media icons on the top right toolbar. Jim is active on Facebook and Twitter, posting the best apologetics articles from over 250 Christian blogs around the country. You'll also find links to Jim's Instagram, Pinterest, and Google Plus accounts, along with the link to the Cold Case Christianity YouTube page. Stay connected with Cold Case Christianity and become a better Christian case maker. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the last piece of Psalm 19 and what it says about special revelation. Let me put it on the, on the wall so you can see it, because the, the first part of this last segment has six sentences that all describe something about God's Word. Uh, you'll see they're in uh, yellow here. So, uh, it's something about God's Word is something else. Something is something. Something is something. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. So, all I had to remember... It seems like every yellow word has to do with God's word, with God's law, with the mind of God, the thoughts of God communicated to us through his word. Okay? So it's not hard to memorize these. It's just different ways of saying the same thing. The law of the Lord, those are his laws, his voiced laws, are perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. Statutes and law, that's pretty close to the same thing. The precepts of the Lord, okay. Commands of the Lord, okay. Uh oh the fear of the Lord. Oh, wait a minute, now, the last one is decrees. Well, it seems to me like law, statute, precepts, commands, and decrees, that's all pretty much saying it the same way. It's right. This, these are the words of law of, of God expressed through his statutes and precepts. So kind of much the, I mean, those, those can be almost synonyms for each other. Until you get to the, to the fifth one, fear of the Lord. What in the world? Now, I, I, little tricks I used in each one of these, right? Uh, you have to kind of sometimes just muscle through with your memory. Uh, you know, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. Uh, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. The, the T-U-T in statutes uh, reminded me of the T-U-T in trustworthy. I don't know why. That was always easy for me to memorize because I'm trying to visualize this. Statutes, trustworthy. There's a T-U-T and an S in there too. In both those words, they always just seem to go together for me. The precepts of the Lord are are right, giving joy to the heart. The T's, the precepts, are right, giving joy to the heart. For some reason, the T's helped me memorize that line. Um, what now, if once you get to the commands of the Lord are radiant, well, what radiates? That's light, and the, what sees light are the eyes. So that wasn't hard for me to memorize. But here's that line, that fifth line, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. Well, okay, I used to always use this kind of a funny enunciation of this. I would say the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ear sound, fear, pure, endure. There's a, to me, they sounded similar. So it wasn't hard to memorize that verse based on the similar sounds of words. And finally, the decrees of the Lord are firm. All of them are righteous. Some of these you just have to kind of muscle through. But what's interesting is that fifth line, right? The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. What the heck? Okay, so all these other synonyms for law or precepts or commands or decrees or what? Okay, then you get fear. Where does that come? What does that even mean? Well, that, that word for fear in Hebrew has a couple of ways of being parsed out depending on context, right? As a matter of fact, it's even described and defined for you in another verse from the Old Testament. Let me put it up on here. It's another proverb. Proverbs 15, verse 33 says, The fear of the Lord in his instruction and wisdom. The fear of the Lord is what? Instruction in wisdom and humility comes becomes uh, comes rather before honor. So if the fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, now this starts to make sense and why you would include it in this list. If in the context of the other five ways of describing precepts, um, decrees, commands, law, statutes, let's go back to that again. Okay, so the law of the Lord is perfect. The statutes of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commands of the Lord, the instruction of in wisdom of the Lord. Oh, see, now that's different. If we just take out and substitute what Proverbs 15 says that fear is, it's instruction in wisdom. Now it's much closer. Instruction in wisdom is the law of the Lord, is the statutes. It's instruction, it's God's wisdom. 
So there's a sense in which the fear of the Lord is really reflecting the wisdom of God is pure, enduring forever, and the decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. Okay, so that's, I just wanted you to see that that fifth uh, sentence can sometimes feel a little bit confusing, because it's the first time that something other than law is described, but in reality, it kind of comes back to the same thing. It is law. Now let's go quickly into the next part of the verse. Now they're more precious than gold, than much pure gold, and sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. You'll notice that in each of these, gold is mentioned, much pure gold. Honey, honey from the honeycomb. So once you memorize gold and honey, the second part of each one of these lines becomes obvious. They're more precious than gold. And what color is honey? It's gold. So I was memorizing this but based on the idea of gold honey. So uh, more precious than gold, than much pure gold, a, re a reiteration. Sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb, a reiteration. And I know this is kind of a silly way to do this, but this is they're trying to bring to you what the value of God's word is using stuff that would have been very familiar to the ancients. And what is gold is still gold in the ancient times. And pure gold, oh, that's, that still had value. It's, what, so if you wanted to contextualize this today, you have to ask the question, well, what in our generation still has the value of gold? Well, gold, and well, honey, honey's a little harder to, you can probably find another analogy for honey, but you get the idea. This is how valuable God's word is. Now, the next line says it uh, even more. Uh, I use these, you'll see in the yellow here. By them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. That's how I remember the lines. By them your servant, it's the W-A-R, warned, reward, it's the same. Make sense? Now, this, this next part is a little harder to memorize, but uh, it is helpful it's if you think about what it is, that how we feel before this holy God. If, if you were standing in front of a God who created the entire universe, whose law is this perfect, would you not feel small? Would you not sense your own sense of imperfection if you were standing in front of the God that's been described so far? So for me, I use this to communicate. This is very true. This verse has got it all. This verse has got evidence for God, natural revelation, evidence for God, and special revelation. And then how we ought to respond to this evidence is the last part of the psalm. Take a look at it. But who can discern their own errors? You would start to recognize your own error if you were standing in front of this kind of God. Please forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins, errors, for need forgiveness, sins. I remember this entire passage here because I, I'm looking at it in terms of its focus on error, sin, and forgiveness. Because then I will be blameless, innocent of great trans, uh, transgression. Now, that's, I think, uh, helpful for me because it, it, how I memorize the verse, the, the psalm, is it starts with the uh, evidence for God, big evidence from the universe, evidence from God from spe special revelation, which reveals to me my own sense of imperfection. And now my response is to say, I need to be forgiven. I want to be blameless, innocent of great transgression. And then it ends with a verse section that most of us have heard in a number of different songs, different ways we've heard it. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, isn't this interesting? I've memorized this because, you know, words of my mouth and meditation of my heart. And then what does it say? It says, be pleasing in your sight. Can you see words? No. Can you see the meditation of my heart? No. Yet it's voiced this way, that God is all-knowing. And even the things that cannot be seen are understood by a holy God. Who's, this is why we are revealed as imperfect. Because you might have a good day where you're able to act like you're perfect on the outside, but God knows the things and sees the things that can't be seen. He says he sees the words of your mouth. He sees the meditation of your heart. Think about that for a second. That means that nothing is hidden. And if that's the case, we must rely on something other than our own perfection to be united with God. The gospel is ripe to be preached because only the gospel tells us how, as an imperfect being, we can stand before a perfect being. It's because we take on the identity of Christ, what He did for us on that cross. We accept His positional perfection even though we are practically imperfect. This is how I try to use Psalm 19 to make a case for God's existence, for the value of the law, and what it does in my own life, what it reveals about me, and what my response ought to be. I hope that these discussions about how to memorize scripture and use them to communicate truth are helpful for you as well. Until next time, I'll see you right here at Cold Case Christianity.